What's the definition of megalith? If we're going by the book, it's a large stone that forms part of a prehistoric monument. Describing a megalith in such dry terms takes away the sense of wonder we feel when we look upon them, though. Megaliths were either created or used by our ancient ancestors for reasons we can barely even pretend to understand. You'll find them all over the world, and you'll also find the best of them here in this video. We're starting off on the Scottish island of Staffa, which is home to an astonishing series of natural caves. Whether you're looking at Fingal's Cave, Clamshell Cave, or both, you can't help but be left in awe by the beauty that nature has created here. In fact, it's hard to escape the feeling that these caves must surely have been shaped by human hands. Fingal's Cave is an especially impressive example, and has inspired everybody from Jules Verne to the members of the legendary British prog rock band Pink Floyd. The hexagonal columns of basalt that line the sides of the sea cave look almost like columns, creating a walkway for visitors to safely walk through the cave and remain above the water level. The ancient Celts called this place Wambin, which translates as the Cave of Melody. They noticed that it was similar to the Giant's Causeway in Ireland, but couldn't have known that Clamshell Cave, Fingal's Cave, and Giant's Causeway were all created by the same ancient lava flow 60 million years ago. The caves might be all natural, but that doesn't stop them from feeling magical. Our next megalith goes by two names, Sail Rock and Paris Rock. It's a colossal sandstone monolith close to the shore of the Black Sea in Krasnodar Krai, Russia, and has been standing since the late Cretaceous Age. The Sail Rock name comes from the distinctive shape of the massive rock, which looks a little like a ship's sail. The very existence of the rock seems to fly in the face of logic. It's 80 feet tall, 60 feet wide, but only about 3 feet thick at its thickest point. Weathering should have forced it to crumble thousands of years ago, but it remains standing. There's a large hole in the surface of Sail Rock, and nobody knows how it got there. The most commonly told story is that it was created as a defense against mountain artillery during the Caucasian War, but there's no evidence to support this. Sail Rock has been declared as a natural monument in Russia since November 1971 and is cared for by the local council, but there's no restriction on people visiting or even climbing on it. That might have to change if Sail Rock is to stick around for future generations to see. The previous two megaliths we've looked at were shaped by nature. Our next was shaped by human hands. These are the Barabar Hill Caves of India. They were created and carved during the time of the Maurya Empire, a little over 2,300 years ago. The most famous and photographed of the caves is Lomas Rishi, which receives special attention for its elaborate entrance. Above the entrance, you'll find the oldest surviving Chartra arch in India. This was a staple of Indian cave carving for centuries, and that tradition might well have started with Lomas Rishi. The first users and occupants of the caves were members of religious sects, including Makali Gosala, who founded the Ajivka sect. The inscriptions within them refer to both Buddhist and Hindu beliefs, so this might even have been a multicultural meeting place. Amazingly, it seems that the people who created the caves knew a thing or two about sound engineering. The walls of the innermost caves have been polished almost to a shine. Because of that, any singing or chanting that went on within those walls would be significantly amplified. There are countless examples of ancient rock art in the British Isles, and the style of the art is different to that which is found on mainland Europe. While ancient Europeans tended to carve human or animal shapes into rock, the ancient inhabitants of Britain instead made geometric shapes and patterns of the kind that can be found in Northumberland. There are so many works of ancient rock art in Northumberland that they've enjoyed protected status since 2014. The oldest of the carvings were created a little over 6,000 years ago, which means that they're older than both Stonehenge and the Pyramids of Egypt. 
Over 1,200 examples of ancient Northumbrian rock art have been found so far, scattered all over the country, and it's a virtual certainty that more will be found in the future. There doesn't seem to be a pattern to the markings. Some are little more than hollow circles, whereas others have interlocking shapes and a greater degree of intricacy. Historians have speculated that they might be territory markers, but they don't have any solid evidence to back up that idea. They could mean just about anything, or they might mean nothing at all. Iran is a country that's full of wonderful ancient monuments, but none quite like the Pigeon Towers of Isfahan. Each of these buildings is like a work of art, which makes it all the more amazing that they were designed for no less humble a purpose than providing homes to thousands of pigeons. The most famous of them is the Mardavich Pigeon Tower, but you could stand inside almost any of them and be equally impressed by the beauty of the work. The reason that the towers exist is that during the 16th and 17th centuries, pigeon excrement was valuable in Iran because it's rich in nitrogen. That made it an ideal fertilizer for Isfahan's many cucumber and melon fields. The towers can be up to 75 feet tall and look like massive honeycombs. Each indentation in the interior walls is a small roost designed to provide space for precisely one pigeon, with as many as 14,000 pigeons in each tower. It's thought that there were once hundreds of towers in Isfahan but most have long since been demolished or fallen down. Some of them, including the Mardavish Tower, are still operational. The ancient Chaco people thought of Pueblo Benito in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, as the center of the world. Even looking at it today, it's easy to see why they were so in love with it. You don't have to be a language expert to understand that its name translates into English as Beautiful Town. The Chaco people started building Pueblo Benito somewhere close to the year 850 and continued to work on it for the next three centuries. By the time they'd finished, their creation was four stories high and contained an incredible 650 rooms. Historians don't know what happened inside those rooms. From what little we can discern from the carvings and etchings left behind on some of the walls, it seems that the Chaco society might have been run by women, with men taking on a subservient role. Pueblo Benito sits at the heart of a much larger set of buildings and features that stretch across the New Mexico desert for more than nine miles. In fact, nothing larger than this was created anywhere in North America until the 19th century. By that point, Pueblo Benito had been abandoned for the best part of eight centuries. Legend has it that the Hunabedden Dolmens of Drenthe in the Netherlands were created by giants. We can be reasonably sure that giants weren't really involved in this enormous ancient construction project, but we have a lot of unanswered questions about how the dolmens were put together. Scientists believe the impressive megalithic site to be roughly 5,000 years old. Archaeologists and historians have never been able to identify the culture that built it so we also don't know why they built it. Excavations have revealed that the dolmens were used by the Funnel Beaker people as a burial site, but it's thought to be unlikely that the Funnel Beaker people created the dolmens. It's probable that they simply came across the Hunabedden dolmens and decided they'd work well as tombs for their people. The people who lived in the Netherlands of the time have long been thought to be nomadic, but nomadic people wouldn't take the time to create something so large from 40-ton rocks. So who did? On the other hand, maybe we should revise our opinion of the people who lived in the Netherlands 5,000 years ago. After all, there was a culture building fairly impressive stone buildings in Russia 25,000 years ago. You'll find them scattered across the Caucasus Mountains, most notably on the outskirts of cities like Topsa, Sachi, and Novorossiysk. The dating of the monuments is a controversial topic among European archaeologists. While there's plenty of evidence to support the idea of them being 25,000, there are some who try to ignore that evidence and say that they're only around 6,000 years old instead. 
we can see why they'd be reluctant. The buildings are made of precisely dressed cyclopic blocks of stone, shaped into 90 degree angles or curved to make perfect circles. Their origin is uncertain, as is their purpose. They're too small and impractical to have been used as homes, but there's also no direct evidence that they were used as tombs. They're often described as tombs, but the people who use that description can't back it up. They're an ancient mystery, perhaps one that's even more ancient than anyone wants to admit. The Arctic Henge in Raufrhofen, Iceland, looks for all the world like it's been standing in position since the dawn of humanity. That's how it's supposed to look. In reality, it's something far more modern, but we're including it here because it's still a fantastic megalithic site. You can think of it as a modern-day monument to ancient pagan beliefs, and it's a superb place to come and see the natural phenomenon known as the Northern Lights. You might struggle for accommodation, though, because the Arctic Henge is next to one of the most remote northern villages in Europe. It was built in 1996, and was inspired by an Edic poem called The Prophecy of the Seeress. Each of the 72 stone blocks represents one of the dwarves in the poem. This description would probably make a lot more sense if you'd read the poem, which we thoroughly recommend. Even after over a quarter of a century, the Arctic Henge is still thought of as a work in progress as of 2022. When it's eventually finished, if that day ever comes, it will likely be the largest pagan site in the entire world. While we're in Scandinavia, it would probably be rude to move on without stopping off at Sverdifjell. We know we said at the start of this video that megaliths ought to be made of stone, but we also said that such a description is too dry and too basic. That gives us just enough wiggle room to include these three massive Viking-style swords jutting out of the scenic landscape in Stavanger, Norway. Sverdifjell is a Norwegian national monument, erected to mark the location of an ancient battle that culminated in the unification of Norway under a single banner. It was the Battle of Harsfjord in the year 872, and took place between the warring factions of King Harald Fairhair and two lesser-known forces, the names of which Harald and Shord were erased from history after he won the battle. The swords were erected in 1983 during the reign of King Olav V. Each sword is more than 30 feet tall and modeled on the style of traditional Viking sabers. Two are plain, but the third is topped with a crown to symbolize Harald's victory. It's an unusual national monument, but frankly, we wish there were more like it. We're going to play a little fast and loose with the definition of megalith again because we want to include the Rosetta Stone. It feels only right because the Rosetta Stone is one of the most important discoveries in the history of archaeology. The inscriptions on this stone made it possible for us to understand the hieroglyphs of the ancient Egyptians and finally begin to get a handle on their culture. The stone was created by order of Ptolemy V in the year 196 BCE. To declare himself the one true pharaoh of Egypt, he had a grand proclamation etched upon the stone in both Greek and hieroglyphic to ensure that everybody would be able to read it. By the time the stone was rediscovered in 1799, we already understood how to read ancient Greek script. Knowing that the message said the same thing in both languages meant that we could decode the Egyptian hieroglyphs by comparing them to the Greek text. This priceless, hugely important artifact can today be found in the British Museum, but there's an increasing feeling that it should be returned to Egypt. There's a general assumption that ancient megaliths were carved by the hands of men, but the legends and folk tales of Portugal say that the majority of its megalithic sites and standing stones were created by women. In fact, those same legends say that most of the stone monuments of ancient Europe were built by women, and that these women were called the Moras Encantadas. They were capable of magically bestowing fertility and riches on individuals, and all they asked for in return was milk. 
On the other hand, they also sometimes hoarded the golden rays of the sun and transformed into angry snakes with bulls for guardians. It's all very confusing. They're credited with creating sites like Zerez Kromlek near Alentejo and Casina de Mura in Orance. What the legends have failed to record is precisely why these seemingly omnipotent women created the dolmens. Nevertheless, they became spiritual centers and meeting points in Portugal during the time before Christianity, and were considered such a threat to the establishment of Christianity in Portugal that Christian bishops eventually banned the annual gatherings that once took place around them. Some Portuguese dolmens were destroyed for the same reason, whereas others were rebranded as sacred Christian sites with made-up stories to go with them. In the process, their true history may have been lost. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!